Hello, everybody, and welcome to week six of 3P seminars, brought to you by a collaboration between the CPT, Cure Parkinson's Trust, the World Parkinson Coalition, and Van Andel Institute. My name is Lisa Berquist, and I'm a postdoc at the Van Andel Institute. And here with me today is my co chair, Michaela Johnson, also a postdoc at the Van Andel Institute. She will be sharing the second part of today's session. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, today as well a polling option at the bottom of your screen. So for those of you who haven't responded to our survey that we posted on Twitter and sent out in various emails, please take some time and respond to this poll to help us decide the future direction of uh, the 3P seminars. And like, again, you have the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen to pre-submit your questions throughout uh, today's two uh, session, two topics, two speakers. So first out, we have Eric Yu, who's a PhD student at McGill University, and he will be talking about heterogeneous parking variants and copy number variations in Parkinson's disease. So I'll now hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so I'll share my screen now. Okay. So hi, everyone. Today, uh, uh, wait, okay. So hi everyone, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the role of heterozygous parking mutation in Parkinson's disease. So when we hear about Parkinson's disease, usually in the media, we often see old folks um, that has tremor or other movement problems. However, did you know that Parkinson's disease can start as early as the age of 30 or even the age of 16. And this is, this category of patients are usually called early onset Parkinson's disease patients. And prior studies found that uh, mo the most common genetic cause of early onset Parkinson's disease are homozygous or compound heterozygous variants in the Parkinson gene. Between six to 12% of people with PD symptoms before the age of 50 carry biallelic Parkinson mutations. The Parkin gene encodes the Parkin protein, which is an E3 ubiquitin protein ligase important in mitophagy. This gene also has a high rate of single nucleotide variants, or SNV, and copy number variation, uh, or CNV, and this is because it is located in a genomic region prone to rearrangements. An interesting feature that distinguishes biallelic Parkin carriers is the different neuropathology we see compared to sporadic PD patients. Uh, the biggest observation is first the absence of Lewy body, which is the, the hallmark of alpha synuclein accumulation. And second of all, uh, neurodegeneration in Parkin patients seems to be limited to the substantia nigra and locus cerealis and doesn't spread to other brain region. So it is therefore possible that these patients represent a distinct subgroup. However, the role of heterozygous Parkin SNVs and CNVs in Parkinson's disease have not been clearly established by association studies. Prior studies have shown contradictory results in familial PD and early onset Parkinson's and even late onset Parkinson's disease patients using SNVs and or CNVs. So the goal of this study was to is then to analyze the role of heterozygous Parkinson variants using both single nucleotide variants and copy number variation. Uh, in, and we decided to include both late onset and early onset Parkinson's disease patients to have a complete view of the genetic landscape. And in total, we had 2,807 unrelated and consecutively recruited PD patients and 3,627 controls from three cohorts that we sequenced. And this included in total 1,903 late onset PD patients and 542 early onset Parkinson's disease patients. Unfortunately, age of onset was not av available for 324 patients. Uh, first of all, we had the McGill cohort. Uh, the, the McGill cohort is composed predominantly of French and French Canadian participants of European ancestry. Next, the Columbia cohort are people recruited from New York with uh, European ancestry and P 
people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent from New York. Finally, the Sheba Medical Center is from participants recruited in Israel with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Uh, Parkinson's disease was diagnosed by movement disorder specialists according to UK brain brain criteria or the movement disorder society criteria. Uh, we performed the sequencing using molecular inversion probes uh, or MIPS. The MIPS are specifically targets the coding sequence of the of genes of interest and then probes are captured and the targeted uh, regions are amplified with PCR. Afterward we add barcodes and samples are pulled and sequenced. Uh, in total in our library we have 50 genes known or suspected to affect Parkinson's disease. Uh, we then perform some standard quality control steps such as filtering by depth of coverage, missingness, and genotyping quality. We decided to divide the var variants by minor allele frequency into rare and common variants. Uh, finally, variants were also classified by their clinical significance into five categories. Category, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, uncertain significance, likely benign, and benign. Uh, next, uh, we, we use a multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification or MLPA to detect CNV in the Parkin gene, since this is the gold standard to detect CNV. And the MALPA uses two probe to target loc the, lo the locus of interest, or in our case, the exons of Parkin. Two probes contain the forward and reverse primer, and it's only when both probes are ligated that a complete probe will be amplified. Each complete probe has a unique length so that the resulting amplicons can be separated and identified by electrophoresis. The forward primer is also fluorescently labeled so that we it can be compared to the reference to determine whether there has been a deletion or duplication. Uh, furthermore, uh, instead of using MLPA, we decided in this study to study a, in this study to use a computational method to detect uh, CNV from MIPS using the recounts of each probe. And to run exome depth, we need a test sample and pull and a pool of reference samples. Then uh, the exome depth will select references uh, with uh, the highest recount correlation, so that for each region targeted by a probe. Just like in MLPA, the test count is compared to the reference samples and the, this read ratio will tell us whether it's a deletion or duplication. And we decided to use exome depth in our study since it has a high sensitivity and specificity when compared to a, a MLPA. We also show that its performance compared to another recount based CNV calling method. However, some samples were not available for exome depth due to the lack of a proper reference pool for these samples. According to the author, a good quality reference must have a minimum correlation of 0 0.97, which is what we use to filter our samples. So overall, uh, we found 13 biallelic parking rare non-synonymous carriers with most of them have early age of onset. Uh, the most common uh, SNV in our cohort is a frame shift mutation, while for CNV is exon 3 deletion. Here you can also see three controls with biolytic mutations, but knowing that some of the variants are benign, we can safely uh, rule out of, of biolytic Parkin pathogenic mutations. So to test the association of rare heterozygous Parkin variants for Parkinson's disease, uh, we used a SCATO or optimized sequence kernel association test. And we separated the mutations by different category, uh, which are CAD scores, whether they are functional, whether it's non-synonymous, loss of function or pathogenicity. Uh, here, CNVs were considered as pathogenic and loss of function mutations, and all analysis were adjusted for age, sex, and ethnicity. So here in this table, we see the different percentage in carriers versus percentage of carriers in control. 
uh, in each cohort and combined in by meta-analysis. We also checked for SNV, CNV, and pathogenicity combined and separated. Uh, the p-values shown here are before Balfourani correction, where then the alpha will be equal to 0 0.018. So even the strongest association found, which is in our meta-analysis with pathogenic SNV and CNV, did not pass multiple testing. Besides, we also see that there's higher frequency in controls compared to cases, which rules out the risk of uh, these variants possible for risk of PD. Sec second of all, we also did the analysis to see the effect of heterozygous Parkin variants on age of onset of Parkinson's disease. We have here age of onset of carriers versus non-carriers for each cohort separate and combined. We also checked for like before SNV and CNV and pathogenicity combined and separated. And again, nothing passes Bonferroni correction and it's not significant. So to summarize, we found that the frequency of heterozygous SNV and CNV in Parkin are not are similar in PD patients and controls. Uh, these results do not support a role for heterozygous Parkin variants in their risk for Parkinson's disease or its age of onset. We were able to successfully detect at CNV and SNV in indels using a simple and fast and cost-effective method. Uh, using this approach, we identified nearly 200 different rare Parkin variants and 53 participants with Parkin CNV with high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, we think this kind of approach will be well suited for large scale screening of Parkinson's disease co cohorts. As I've mentioned earlier, there have been multiple studies analyzing the role of heterozygous Parkin mutation with conflicting results. These conflict might rise from different screening approaches. So some studies might first sequence all patients for rare SNV and or CNVs and then sequence only these selected variants in controls. This approach will create a bias as the controls might carry other pathogenic Parkin mutation, uh, mutations. And meanwhile, other studies sequence all patients and controls for heterozygous SNV or CNV in a more systematic way. And the majority of them found negative results. And systematic analysis, as was done in this current study, will avoid misrepresenting the genetic landscape of the study population. Uh, finally, we think this study has also some application in clinical trials. Um, since treatments that target specific genes and proteins such as SNCA, GBA, and LARC2 are being tested in clinical trials. However, we need to know who benefits and who doesn't. And since biallelic parking carriers has no accumulation of alpha synuclein and no Lewy body, a treatment targeting alpha synuclein will not be efficient and then should be excluded. So we recommend that only biallelic Parkin variant carriers should be excluded from these trials because we did not detect an association between heterozygous Parkin variants and Parkinson's disease. So it's, it is more likely that the presence of heterozygous Parkin variants in Parkinson's disease is by chance. So overall, our method for rapid and cost-effective detection of Parkin variants will be useful for pre-trial screening and for clinical and basic science studies, specifically targeting Parkin patients. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Eric, for that very interesting presentation. So we're gonna kick off the Q&A session for or the Q&A part of the session now. So I just wanted to ask, uh, do you, what are your plans, your future directions for the project? What are you gonna do next? So here we only looked at SNV and CNV systematically in Parkin and a future direction could be looking at the other uh, top hits in Parkinson's disease, such as GBA and SNCA or even LARC2 and see if there's um, any interesting findings we can uh, see in these genes uh, looking when looking at CNV and SNV since it's a 
direction that not a lot of people have been uh, exploring so far. Yeah, that sounds like a very interesting way to move forward. Uh, we have a first question from an anonymous attendee saying, nice work. What are the clear examples, not theoretical or, or maybe, of these types of studies leading to tangible therapeutic benefits, but not empty promises? So these type of studies are, first of all, more basic science uh, studies. So I cannot say, I cannot promise it will lead directly to some uh, tangible uh, therapeutic benefits. Uh, however, um, these, uh, like my type of studies are more geared toward trying to subtype Parkinson's disease so that future therapeutic benefits could target the right patients uh, and uh, probably uh, move forward better in clinical trial phases. Yeah, agreed. It's a very, it's a good tool to make sure that the correct, correct, that the people more most uh, likely to benefit from a treatment are included in a specific trial. Yeah. And tagging on to this, uh, you mentioned that people with parking mutations don't have uh, alpha-synuclein accumulation as in Lewy bodies. So what do you think would be a good target for this population in the sense of treatments when we have these antibody uh, targeting, uh, alpha-synuclein antibody targeting treatments out there now? What do you think is the way forward for uh, this subtype of PD patients? Uh, honestly, I haven't thought in this direction yet since uh, I'm not working uh, in uh, the fa field of uh, therapeutics, but uh, it would probably be some way to, some kind of gene therapy method to try to rescue uh, Parkin as uh, uh, loss, these loss of function mutation will cause Parkin to be, uh, to have very low expression com compared to the, its wild type. And some way to rescue uh, parking is probably the best way to uh, uh, find to yeah. uh, th therapies. Yeah. Thanks. So Sushil Kulkarni is uh, saying, "Nice work, done. nice work." Uh, why is the analysis done by SCAT O? Have you done comparison using burden analysis? I hope that makes more sense to you than it does to me. <laughs> yeah. So the reason we chose SCAT O is because uh, SCAT O is optimized uh, to pick the best, uh, like this, between the burden analysis and uh, a SCAT analysis, so that and current analysis, so that the the test with the mo most power in this in the subset of uh, uh, mutations we picked will be will have this, will be, uh, how can I say it? Uh, will have the, the most power to answer that question. So uh, Scalos actually includes burden analysis. Uh, it's just, I haven't like shown all the, like the comparison between burden analysis and uh, SCAT and Scalos because in all three, uh, they were not significant. Okay. I hope so... that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> the person asking the question can ask a follow-up question if they want something clarified. <laughs> so you talked that some of the the hits that you saw were benign. Is that do do you know if there's any protective variants? Um, the, so far we found that uh, there are. Like the pack, the Parkin variants are could be more separate into like just pathogenic and benign. And having a benign because it's a recessive disease, uh, uh, having at least one benign mutation uh, could be protective if you don't have two pathogenic mutations in both allele. Uh, however, a benign we also see that having one benign and one pathogenic mutation on the same uh, haplotype 
will probably not, uh, like the benign mutation will not uh, compensate for the pathogenic. Okay. However, uh, uh, I think more functional yeah. studies need to be done in this direction to be uh, more con conclusive. Yeah. It's great for us early career scientists that there's lots of stuff to do still. So another question here is that um, are PD patients, do they have the, is it possible to get screened for this mutation? Like people can be tested for GBA and LARC2 mutations? Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, there are panels uh, where neurologists and clinicians can send to genetic uh, labs to test for these common LARC2 and GBA mutations. And uh, that's one of the goal where uh, using a MIPS, we, we think it will be uh, uh, more cost effective and faster to uh, test a variety of uh, known uh, Parkinson genes, uh, Parkinson's disease genes that uh, people can test before uh, diagnosis. Yeah, sure. Uh, I just had like a final question, and uh, this might not be uh, yep. not be a stupid question. But I saw when you set up those, um, you showed us the different cohorts of patients from McGill, and then from Sheba Medical Center. I saw that the average age for that one was like 30 something and the average age for the, in the control group for the, from the Sheba Medical Center and the average age for the other groups were like 50, 60 something. How do you take that into account when you do your analysis? Uh, yeah, so yeah, one of the limitations of this study is the, like, like you saw the difference in the age and uh, the, and the different proportion of male and female across the different studies. So one way we try to control for that is to adjust our statistical analysis for age and uh, sex, and which will uh, minimize the effect of the disparity of age between our cohorts. Yeah, yeah, because I can imagine it's not super easy to find exactly control match uh, HMASH control groups to all of these studies. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for that super interesting talk. And we're now going to hand it over to Michaela, and she's going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. So our second speaker for today is Sarah Bander Seeger, a postdoc at the NIH, and she is presenting on genome-wide pathway-specific polygenic risk, transcript transcriptomic community networks and functional inferences in Parkinson's disease. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Michaela, for the great presentation. And once again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm now going to uh, share my screen. Um, let's see. Yep. I think it should be working fine now. All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start the presentation giving a brief uh, overview on Parkinson's disease genetics to put you in the context. So Parkinson's disease fits within the wide range of uh, common polygenic disorders that in, are influenced both by genetic and environmental factors. So um, we know that Parkinson's disease etiology lies on a continuum that ranges from uh, Mendelian inheritance that is observed in only a small proportion of cases uh, to more complex inheritance. So to keep in mind for this seminar, um, Parkinson's disease genetics is essentially linked to two hypotheses. So we say the common disease common variant hypothesis that essentially uh, accepts that the, the genetic basis of Parkinson's disease is, is a result of a, of a large number of common variants, and that each of them uh, exert like individually uh, relatively small effects on, on Parkinson's disease risk, but that when considered cumulatively, uh, confer substantial risk. And then we have also the common disease rare variant hypothesis that speculates that a contributing risk component for for disease is, is rare genetic variants, and that these variants have more moderate and large effect, effects because um, they are highly functional and, and deleterious alleles. 
So as a note, as I point here in, in this slide, the Parkinson disease heritability, which is basically for non-geneticists, uh, for you to understand, is, is the proportion of Parkinson's, so of the phenotype, that is uh, attributed or, or explained to genetic influence, is uh, estimated to be around 22%. And only one third of this uh, heritability is, is currently explained by the known uh, Parkinson disease risk law side that have been identified in, in GWAS meta analysis. So this suggests that there is an important proportion of risk that is yet to be identified, uh, likely underlying GWAS subtop hits. So this is genetic variants that have not reached genome wide. Uh, significance yet because of statistical power um, in the form of common variation uh, mostly, but also rare variation and, and structural variation. So, uh, so as you was continue to expand the number of, of loci uh, rising this statistical significance, uh, as I, I'm saying, the majority of these contributors um, are going to individually exert very small effects on, on Parkinson disease risk. So a priority um, in elucidating the, the theology lies in defining that cumulative risk. Um, that, I'm, as I'm saying, like some of it can be under the GWAS uh, level of significance. So our field is, is kind of facing the challenge of understanding how genetic risk can disrupt biological processes and can drive uh, the, the underlying pathology. So we believe that um, unraveling that, uh, how that risk leads to this uh, disruption can kind of um, orientate towards disease modifying uh, therapeutic targets that, that may be effective. So, um, yeah, so with that in mind, um, and using both uh, the largest um, genetics and genomics Parkinson disease uh, data sets available that we have today. We follow a high throughput genetics approach to, to address the following questions. So I'm, I'm going to start uh, with the first question that is, can we connect cumulative genetic effects due to common variation to um, biological pathways in Parkinson's disease? So um, to do so, to address this question, uh, we explore the cumulative effect of pathway-specific genetic variation on Parkinson's disease risk by applying polygenic risk to, to a total of about 2,199 uh, well-defined gene sets that are representative of pathways publicly available in the molecular signature database and that um, comprises the data sets that are listed here that you see uh, in orange. So we have KEG, Biocarta, uh, Reactome, and also some uh, curated gene sets by, by experts uh, from different projects. So, I will not go into so much detail into polygenic risk score since I believe that was already covered in previous seminars. But in summary, uh, using these gene sets, we perform um, linkage disequilibrium clamping, which is a process to nominate independent variants within genes. And then if we see uh, here in this area of this, of this slide, uh, so we use uh, Chang et al. 2017 uh, Parkinson disease summary statistics as the, the reference data set to define our risk allele weights, uh, taking all the variants that are significantly associated with, um, with disease at a peak value below 0 0.05, so they don't reach genome-wide significant. Uh, level. And then we use those variants to construct polygenic risk scores for each of those pathways um, using individual level imputed data that was randomly split as the training data set for our discovery phase and the testing data set for our replication. And all these analyses were based on permutation testing and then um, also adjusted by uh, different covariates such as uh, gender, age, and uh, principal components to account for population structure. So um, also in an attempt to explore uh, what biological processes uh, were associated with uh, Parkinson's disease after excluding known risk factors, uh, the same analysis were, were performed after removing the 90 known uh, PBG was hits that we currently know, and also additional um, SNPs located one megabase upstream and downstream from the signal. And after adjusting for multiple testing, as we see over here, uh, 46 uh, gene sets were associated with Parkinson's disease risk when including 
uh, the Parkinson uh, known loci, and nine, nine, sorry, nine gene sets uh, when removing them. So let's go to the results. So although I, unfortunately, I don't have the time to discuss them all in detail, but the identified pathways are listed here, as you see, and can be clustered into the following categories. So we have pathways within uh, protein and lipid metabolism. We have uh, pathways within metabolism of vitamins and cofactors, uh, programmed cell death related processes, immune system. We have uh, several um, sub processes uh, within the cell transport and trafficking mechanisms, um, several signaling transduction um, pathways, and also um, neuronal transmission uh, across cellular synapses, among, among others. And in red, um, I have highlighted the subgroups where Parkinson's disease pathways lie when removing the teres loci for you to see. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, without going into so much detail, uh, but each of these processes do not have the same impact on, on disease risk. And we can estimate that by calculating the variance explained by the PRS, by the polygenic risk score. So, um, just as an example here, highlighted in, in darker colors, the ones that seem to contribute the most to Parkinson's disease heritability. So, uh, intracellular transport among other processes seems to um, substantially contribute when, when considering common variation. But probably the most interesting thing is that we observe, uh, is what we observe here when accounting for, for known risk. So it seems that there is substantial risk to be uncovered within immune system related processes. Uh, also metabolism of lipids and, and pathways related to basic or um, mediated transport. All right, so let's move on to the second question. So our second question was like, okay, can we place these insights into a cellular context? So let's see what we found. Um, so to address this particular question, we use a uh, single cell RNA sequencing data from the Karolinska Institute obtained from um, several mouse brain regions. And this was used to explore cell types that might be linked to Parkinson's disease risk. So this data set that we used includes um, the specificity of expression for each gene in the genome within um, 24 brain uh, different cell types. And this specificity um, of expression um, is uh, made in, in values that ranges from zero to one and represent like the proportion of the total expression of a gene found in a cell compared to the remaining cells. So the closer the score is to one, the more specific is the expression in that particular cell type. So what we did is we organized all these genes and, and clustered them into 10 groups that we call uh, D-cell. And we calculated what we say polygenic risk score variance, that is basically genetic contribution. And uh, we calculated this within each cell type. Uh, diesel, so with, within each of those uh, 10 different subgroups according to, to the expression specificity. So if we take a look at this plot here that is uh, uh, highlighted in red, uh, so if a particular cell type is associated with or is linked to Parkinson's disease risk, it is expected to observe like a shift in the, in the Lyme distribution with uh, low values, low variance values, low contribution to Parkinson's disease for those non-specific gene sets, so the, the lowest D cells, and then higher uh, variance, higher genetic contribution in um, more uh, specific gene sets, so higher D cells. So we use the same reference uh, training and testing data sets that I mentioned before, and we calculated that trend of increase in uh, polygenic risk score variance per d uh, of you know, the cell type ex um, expression specificity. And it seems that increased uh, PRS variance consistent with uh, increased cell expression specificity was observed for, uh, in a, uh, was significantly uh, observed for uh, dopaminergic adult neurons, serotoninergic neurons, and also uh, radial glia at a p-value below 0 0.05 in both the training and the replication phases. 
And then uh, we wonder whether the same pathways linked to Parkinson's disease risk through common variation could be also contributing to risk through rare variation. So I will go, yeah. So to do so, we perform gene set pardon analysis, including the, the 46 pathways significantly associated with Parkinson's disease risk in phase one by using an, an independent cohort of whole genome sequencing data and assuming uh, this is a kind of a similar approach than, than what Eric used, assuming two different levels of uh, variant frequencies, so minor frequency below 5% and below 1%, and also uh, different levels of functionality, including um, missense variants and loss of function variants that are meant to substantially alter the function of, of the protein. And, uh, also variants with CAT score above 12, because these are predicted to be among the top one or 2% most pathogenic of the genome. So considering minor allele frequency below 5%, uh, we nominated um, 18 pathways, and below, uh, considering frequency below 1%, we nominated 19 pathways. But uh, in summary, it seems that the, the main uh, impact of rare variation on Parkinson's disease risk was identified for immune system-related processes. Uh, the lysosomal pathway that has been uh, previously reported in the literature, uh, but also protein aggregation and uh, neuronal transmission across uh, chemical synapses. So um, our next question uh, aim at addressing the, the possibility of constructing uh, the novel pathways, uh, in this case using transcriptomic data. So I'll talk a little bit about this. So to do this, we explore the, um, uh, we, we basically use something that is called Luban uh, Community Detection, it's a machine learning algorithm to uh, generate a, a de novo transcriptomic map uh, by using RNA sequencing data in, in about 1,600 cases and, and 1,000 controls. And interestingly, we identified 54 de novo expression communities that had genes uh, differentially expressed in, gene, in cases versus uh, controls with a quite high modularity um, score. So we also perform a functional enrichment of these community uh, networks and found a link with processes related to, to immune system response again, also uh, ribosome RNA processing to the nucleus and cytosol, cell cycle, oxidative stress, and, and mitochondrial impairment. So this, this plot, I will uh, briefly summarize what it means. So the X as axis, as we see here, represents the, the gene set enrichment in percentage based on the community map gene list. And then the, the intersection size denotes the, the number of, of genes within um, a certain enrichment categories. So the bigger it is, the more genes um, that category has. And then blue color also indicates the adjusted p-values um, on a, a negative uh, logarithm term scale, in which the darker color um, means that the more significant is. All right, so now that we have already explored the contribution of these uh, thousands of molecular processes on both the trigger for disease, which is the risk, but also the, the effect, so the consequence, expression changes basically, in a systemic manner. Our last question was, okay, can we link risk to functional consequence within biological pathways? So uh, to do so, we perform um, summary database Mendelian randomization, SMR, analysis to prioritize pathways and genes for follow-up functional studies by, by exploring possible genomic associations between uh, cis expression quantitative, quantitative risk loss and Parkinson's. So essentially, uh, risk SNPs that change expression and that this in turn can be linked to Parkinson's disease. So we explore uh, these quantitative trait loci and the, the enrichment that may exist across pathways 
um, much more than what it is, it is expected to be by chance and identify several pathways uh, showing an enrichment of, of QTLs, of these quantitative trait loci, in a whole brain, um, also when focusing only on, on substantia nigra and, and using whole blood. To do so, we use different data sets, such as um, uh, GTEx or um, EG and QTL and so on. So within these pathways, we also prioritize several genes of interest. Uh, so these, these are genes that have uh, recess SNPs that we have already identified as significantly associated with disease by, by the large scale PRS analysis, but that also lead to changes in expression and that we are identifying here through Mendelian randomization, but that also show differential expression in, in the community maps that we built in the previous step. So try to link uh, risk to the functional consequence. So I think I'm running a bit, I'm running out of time with this, so to go into detail, but everything that I have explained today, including uh, you know, this last Mendelian randomization analysis, genes that we prioritize and everything can be found in the Parkinson disease pathways browser that you have here below for those that, that are um, more uh, interesting, interested in further exploring. So, yeah, so just to conclude, I, I think this study kind of represents a, a step forward in, in our understanding of of um, important connections that, that exist between um, uh, genetic factors and functional consequences and um, also the, the etiology of Parkinson's. And just um, to conclude, well, we have here the conclusions. I think I, we just have to move to the questions, right? Uh, but yeah, genome-wide polygenic risk enables the identification of of enriched pathways involved in etiology due to common variation. We identify significant pathways contributing to the heritability of Parkinson outside of what it explains by current GWAS. And then some of the nominated uh, pathways also seem to expand the theological risk spectrum in which both common and rare variation contribute to Parkinson disease susceptibility. Then, um, we constructed a transcriptome map by clustering the novel pathways that are relevant to PD pathology. And finally, a dopaminergic, serotoninergic neurons and radial glia specificity uh, in expression patterns seem to be linked to Parkinson's disease risk and Mendelian randomization help us to prioritize pathways and genes so in functional consequence associated to PD risk. So I would like to wrap up just uh, thanking everybody thank you very much for your attention there are many people involved on this project to list everybody but i would like to thank in first place all the patients that got enrolled in the project and also my uh, data science lab mates at the nih particular my my supervisor andrew singleton and uh, also the international parkinson disease genomics consortium and mpd for all the available data and all our fa our funders including uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation, and, and once again, uh, 3P Seminars for this opportunity. And I put here, as you see, my email and my Twitter handle if anyone has uh, any questions. And I believe that uh, we can now move on to the uh, round of questions. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Very interesting genetic heavy topic there. So I guess to start off with, we have a question from Simon here on how would you explain what you do to a family member or to the non-scientific community? Yes, this In is a nutshell. A, <laughs> yeah, this is a great question. So we will say that uh, we try to apply different uh, approaches. Uh, so we try to explore um, genetic risk factors and the consequences of those factors. So we'll say that genetic risk factors are like kind of the trigger or like the, the door to the susceptibility for disease. So we try to explore that, but we also try to explore the functional consequence. So the effect of those risk factors on disease. And we try to do that using uh, data sets uh, uh, that are, you know, data sets. If I have to specify the methodology, then I'll say, 
genotyping, but also sequencing and also RNA sequencing, whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing. So we try to explore these from different angles and from different perspectives. And we try to nominate uh, candidates like um, uh, genes that can be possible drug targets for further investigation uh, uh, within, you know, uh, in, from different points of view, like functional studies and so on. So, so if we manage to replicate that, then it means that we are doing the right thing and we are trying to prioritize targets for, for therapies for them. Yeah, so I guess just following on from that a bit, what do you think is the utility of this approach for drug target discovery? Yeah, so it's kind of, the same. So if we manage to uh, to perform screenings in an unbiased manner, this was a high throughput uh, analysis in which we didn't have any previous hypothesis. This was like a completely uh, free hypothesis approach. So if we manage to nominate uh, pathways using different approaches from different perspectives and angles, then I think that is the way to nominate the, the drug targets. Yeah. A uh, question here from Patrick. How do you think that the neutrophil degranulation pathways that are involved in the PD genetic risk? So do you think they affect a very early environment event such as bacterial infection that could trigger Parkinson's? Yeah, so I'm not very certain about how to answer this because I'm not a cell biologist. I'm, I work more on bioinformatics, so I'm not sure. I think it will be very interesting to, to perform this analysis um, maybe by, uh, you know, exploring age at onset and like defining different subgroups according to age at onset and, and see how um, if we observe still uh, uh, this pathway early in the disease or, or late, to see how, how that cluster between different groups of disease. Um, unfortunately, I haven't done this yet. I think um, it's, uh, this project is already quite uh, heavy to digest. So, so maybe another researcher can work on that. I encourage. And just a follow up from Patrick there, the data that you presented today, is that uh, available in publication or via bioarchives yet? Yeah, so it's hopefully going to be available uh, maybe at the end of this week. I'm not very sure yet, but we have a manuscript already. Um, so yes, hopefully it will be available. I'll, I'll, I'll hope to, to update that whenever that happens, yeah. So he should keep his eyes peeled on your Twitter account for when it's ready and available. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. The R squared seem relatively low for the variance explained by the pathway. Is this typical for the PRS analyses? So the variance? Yeah, the variance. So um, this is what, what we find when we perform PR size. Uh, the reason why it's low is because it's comparing absolutely all the pathways that we are uh, including in our model, that is 2,199. So that's why we observe uh, very low values, but we are all comparing, uh, we are comparing these pathways to the same scale. So um, it still it answers our question of what are the pathways that uh, kind of contribute the most to the heritability of Parkinson's disease. But yet this, this PRS variance is not uh, exactly telling you that is the heritability of disease. It's just comparing it within your model. Okay. Uh, another methodological question here. Have you tried exploring other network construction algorithms other than the Leuven networks? Are there similarities? No, I haven't tried. <laughs> I've only tried this uh, ML uh, algorithm. Maybe it would be interesting to, to do uh, other approaches. I know other people like to use co-expression analysis or other type of, of analysis. So I'm sure it would be great if other researchers can also do that. And, and maybe there are overlapping results which uh, will strength uh, this, this analysis, yeah. And can you comment on why did you choose this particular approach for your data set? Um, because I was very interested in studying biological pathways. I think uh, there is a gap in between what geneticists uh, usually do and what cell biologists or other people do. So this could kind of uh, be the link of uh, you know, helping cell biologists to prioritize their work from genetics. So that's 
yeah, I like this project, so I, I put a lot of effort on it, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. Are there specific genes or pathways that you would recommend to focus on as treatment targets for sporadic PD as opposed to like 2 or GBA PD? Yes, so this is, I didn't have the time to go into so much detail. That's why we have a browser for people to navigate. Uh, it's, it's very, it's an interactive uh, um, resource for the PD community and, and I encourage everybody to go through it and take a look. So definitely um, read the manuscript whenever it comes out because you'll see better, you will understand better the pathways that might be the ones to be uh, prioritized and also the genes within those pathways, yeah. Okay, maybe just a final question. Do you believe the approach that you've been using can be extrapolated to non-European ancestry populations? Yes, definitely. That's uh, one of the limitations of this study. This, this is all based on European populations. And unfortunately, we need really large scale cohorts to, to work on, to perform this type of approaches. Otherwise, we don't have a, a statistical power. I know uh, Parkinson's disease genetics, uh, our field is moving towards studying the genetics in underrepresented populations. And definitely, I, I hope one day we can ap apply these approaches to, to those populations too and look for replication. Excellent. Well, thank you for your great presentation and answering questions. Oh, one more final question. If the PD is approximately 22% heritable, what do you think might explain the etiology for remaining PD cases? Yeah, so, I mean, environmental factors and stochastic factors that we don't know uh, is, is what is contributing. Like we know that by common variation, uh, there is about 22% of, of contribution from the genetics point of view, but yeah, the rest, we know that there are there is already a lot of rare variation and structural variation that we cannot estimate so far with, with uh, genome-wide genotyping technologies, uh, but in the future, like as, as we are moving forward with long read resequencing and so on, hopefully we'll be able to, to dissect more genetics and someone will also explore environmental factors and so on. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a lot we don't know about the disease. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for your presentation and your very good Q&A session. If anyone has any further questions that they want to propose to our two speakers today, feel free to go to the 3P discussion Facebook page and post your questions there. So I'd just like to thank our two speakers and then also mention if anyone attending today, if you haven't used the polling feature and you would like to contribute to the survey on how the 3P seminar series has been held so far and how you would like to see this continue in the future, we really appreciate you going to the survey. The link can be found at Twitter and on the 3P Facebook page. Uh, this is a really short survey, so it will take you less than two minutes. Or if you know of other people who have attended these seminars, if you want to pass on or email them the link, we'd really appreciate that. And then my final thing I just want to mention is that this Thursday we have a special career advice session. So we have three panelists that are in varying stages of their career. We have Malu Tanzi, Laura Volpicelli Daly, and Michael Henderson who will be participating. And based on the polling results from uh, last week's Thursday seminar, this discussion will include things that like the challenges they've faced in their career pathway, as well as advice on handling difficult situations and professional development, as well as other aspects like um, work life balance. So, Please, if that's something that's interesting to you, join us this Thursday. We hope to see you there. So on that note, thanks to the speakers again for today and thanks everyone for attending and we hope to see you Thursday. Bye. Thank you.